All right, happy Tuesday, January 17th, everybody, and welcome to our Janu or December 2023, now in 2024, jobs report and inflation update. Uh, we hope that you're starting off your year on a good note. I know many have not, uh, but we're here to help you find some answers as to why it's not and how it can be better. And joining us today is, as usual, Associate Professor and Associate Dean at the University of New Mexico, Dr. Riley White, who teaches finance over there. And I said that in a really funny order, but it's okay. Um, he'll go through his presentation today. You're more than welcome to ask questions, uh, be curious about everything that's going on in this job market now. And we'll be looking back and looking forward. So without further ado, uh, Dr. White, over to you. Thank you so much, Albert. Thank you, Colin. And thank you, Albert's List. I appreciate the audience for showing up tonight and uh, spending your Wednesday uh, evening at work, on the way home from work, or within work, or is trapped within work, or looking for work uh, in this job uh, in this job seminar tonight. I'm so pleased to go over some of our macroeconomic data. We're going to cover the year kind of in review. I got a lot of questions uh, from Albert's list on topics that we can answer, but I want you to feel <laughs> trapped like office thing. I want you to feel like uh, you can continue to ask questions and put stuff in the chat window. We've got some exceptional groups. Colin and Albert weigh in magnificently throughout this conversation. Uh, we got Aaron in the house, which is really important. Aaron is uh, also a fantastic uh, uh, economist and provides great perspectives on a lot of this stuff. A is for Aaron. So this is great. <laughs> we're so great that you guys made it tonight. So we're going to talk about this and we're going to go over a bunch of different factors. I have uh, the questions that were sent to me. I put them within the document. They are there to discover. We're going to talk about them. And there's a lot to talk about. So this is good. So we're still hopeful for that soft landing in the bottom line. And I'll explain a couple of what reasons about why that is and kind of go forward into a couple of things. We'll take an expansive view on um, some of the stuff that's happened in the last year, focus on the jobs report that just happened, and then we'll rock and roll from there. So let's start without further ado. We've got uh, the December 2023 jobs report right here. Of course, every every week, every month, a new AI generated image involving Albert's list. This involves a long hallway full of graphs, which is taken secretly at Albert's list headquarters, uh, deep uh, within <laughs> Mount Tam. Uh, so in this um, proposal, in this sort of idea that we have today, we're gonna go over the jobs report as it stands. We have some good news about the jobs report. It's not a spectacular jobs report, but it's, spe it's spectacular because it's not bad. And I'll reiterate why that is. So one thing, I know it knows how to spell Albert's list. I actually had to edit it slightly, so it, miss it tried to spell Albert right. Uh, Albert says, Charles asks, is California's fiscal situation putting them on track to be the next Detroit? That's a really interesting question, because Detroit right now is doing some really clever things with property taxes. Uh, so even when we think about Detroit, maybe yesterday's Detroit, is it now California? The fiscal situation isn't good. Um, and one of the things to think about at state level fiscal situations, one of the difficulties with governments is that while the U.S. government can maintain a challenging um when we spend more money than we have uh uh resources we can issue bonds uh and as a consequence you know we can deficit spend municipalities and governments don't have that luxury and so often you end up in situations where you've got you know you know fiscal shortages that are often significant it does not bode well for the revenue mix in california as it stands right now but it is not an insurmountable issue it does require a tremendous amount of work to get revenues going again and a lot of creativity into what that means and so and so where revenues come from and where those you know where those spaces are is a really complex issue particularly when it comes to you either have to increase revenues meaningfully or decrease expenditures or some combination of both there's of course concern with increased revenues uh that um, you, of course, looking at the tax code, looking at making California less competitive from a business environment than other states. And on the other side, on the revenue side, you have to look around and say, um, you know, if you look at this and say, well, you know, if we raise taxes this way or we um, or we engage in 
uh, different fiscal planning or we lose certain services on the expenditure side, then um, we're providing less for, you know, significantly less for, for the people who are paying taxes. And I think most people from what I've spoken to on the ground involving the situation view it as, I mean, it is just a, a terrible situation all, all around. It does not mean in itself that it will lead that way. What will dictate the future of California will be the fiscal decisions that are made in response to this debt burden or this uh, deficit, I should say. And that's actually a great topic. And I didn't go into detail about this in this meeting, but one of the things that we can talk about maybe next month is I can do kind of a deep dive into some um, the proxies of you know how municipal government or state and local governments work regarding their financing, as well as what options have worked well for revenue and what options have not worked well for revenue, as well as balancing other fiscal issues. Oh, look at this, the year in danger. This is actually great. Aaron just gave me a great link I sh I, that I can borrow in this. What a positive spin. Danger signs for California's economy. Unemployment's itching up, tech layoffs continue, and IPOs are waning. All of those are true, which we'll talk about this. And particularly since it went from that vacillation of that budget surplus to this huge budget deficit. Um, and you've got like a huge amount of income tied, your huge amount of revenue streams is tied up in income taxes, which is also a really challenging environment. So there's a lot of things that can be done, including reforming aspects of property tax, looking at other situations that might be uh, providing this. Um, sales taxes are optional, but those are also variable and they're also regressive. Um, you know, uh, jobs growth, of course, is slowing in general. IPOs are always cyclical. And I wouldn't, I would, I think, Coincidentally, IPOs are going down for a lot of reasons nationally, so it's not a California specific thing. Um, but I also think that this is worth <laughs> this is worth really engaging this. So I'm actually going to bookmark this, Aaron, and then we can talk about this. So let's talk about this. Okay, so here's what we got. Boom goes the dynamite. So we got uh, Dan says 216k new jobs. Yes, just 216 new jobs. It is a K in there, and I apologize. Um, it has been a week of weeks, so there are going to be some typos in there. Just call them out as you see them. Thank you, Daniel. So one of those things, yes, just 216 jobs all at one factory. No, we added 216,000 jobs, which is about average for us in a jobs report in a good economy, in one that is not declining. It's not spectacularly rising. It's not spectacularly dropping. It is a steadily increasing rate, and that is a number that we like. But where we found those jobs is interesting. So we've had a lot of questions around people who feel, for one reason or another, for very good reasons, that you feel that the job market itself, well, you have all these positive spin about the job market as a whole. You're like, it's taken me months to find a job. I'm looking for months for a job. The jobs are appearing in repetitively in industries, um, in, very, in certain industries and not in other industries. Example. Like uh, 74,000 jobs in education and health. Most of those are exclusively health jobs. Health jobs are a big uh, proportion of this. It's been a very robust environment for health jobs. Healthcare in general, because of just um, demographics, plus um, a lot of incentives that indicate that from an expansionary point of view, the growth in the healthcare market is likely to continue regardless of whether there'll be a recession or not a recession, making business planning and investment a little bit bolder in this category. You're seeing um, a, lot of, a lot of increases here. 52,000 in government. This is part of actually a trend nationally um, that we've seen where we're adding government jobs um, in very competitive ways that we hadn't before. Um, and it's interesting to see this. 40,000 in leisure and hospitality. That is, again, just continued uh, 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 continued um, benefit from the huge losses that we saw in the beginning of the pandemic that hit hotels, restaurants, et cetera, over and over very terribly. And then, of course, we lost jobs in the transportation and warehousing structure uh, uh, sector, which is due to this sort of overcompensation that happened with the supply chain issues we saw last year and the year before. So we had this... Um, you know, flooding the market. So we had the recession happen in 2020. We've got all of this money floating around in capital from incentives. Uh, demand came soaring back um, that put huge pressure on supply chains. Uh, so there was a huge pressure to hire, hire, hire transportation warehousing. And we probably overhired in the sector. And now you're seeing in these repeated months in the last few months, some, some clawback of some of those hires that we saw. And that's going to be... Um, that's going to be there as well. So we've got a whole bunch of um, 
things going on, but not all sectors are created equal. And I don't want you to feel just because, oh, this is a sunny jobs report, that it's necessarily sunny for your sector. Of note, uh, financial services and information has not been doing particularly well nationally, not only because of the layoffs we've seen in tech, but also layoffs we've seen in the financial sector. There hasn't been a great deal of hiring, and it's been a really uh, a tricky situation. Now, this is interesting. U.S. Are you talking about U.S.? Lucy asked a question on Facebook. Curious about tax code section 174. <laughs> <laughs> it's that one of those things. I'm a finance professor, but I'm not an accounting or tax professor. So I don't, <laughs> it's really good. If you're looking for tax chat, uh, there is another space that we can enter in, U.S. Tax Code 174. So so this amortization of research and exp ex experimental expenditures. <laughs> hmm. All right. Hmm. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Oh, here we go. Prior to the passage of the 2017s, TCJ, I see we're going, allow companies to handle the tax bill to specified research or experimental budgets in one of two ways. Either it was capitalized and amortized over the course of five years or written off annually. Ah, we're coming to some tough questions today. I actually, I got to tell you, I don't know. One of the things is, and I love the question, Lucy, and I'm so glad you asked this, but again, one of the differences between a finance person and an economics person and a tax person is whether or not they, or an accounting person, is whether or not they fall asleep in accounting classes. So, so we ended up in the econ economics and tax side. I know less about the nature of, oh, layoffs. Okay, this is really good. So I don't, okay, I don't have a good answer for you then, certainly. I see this. I see that, uh, ah, I see. There are some bigger effects that will be part of this. Let me look that up, Lucy. So here's the deal. So because you've got that, oh my gosh, you guys are just doubling down on the tax today in the comments. Oh, you know, I had 12 meetings in a row before this and I was really jazzed about, about giving this presentation. So I do not know enough about this. So I will I will deflect that uh, because I don't know enough to respond to the R&D side of that. Um, I'll do some research on my side and I'll get you an answer for next for next time we do this. That's really good. So anyway, one of those things, so let's talk about this, because I do have things that I can talk about today that I did prepare for for this. Um, so labor force participation in general dropped 0.3% uh, to 62.5%. Uh, that is not a good sign. So participation includes uh, the percentage of workers who are uh, adults and eligible potentially to work that either have a job or are looking for a job. And that's dropped a bit, even as unemployment remains steady. Um, so does it mean that um, we're looking at uh, uh, people who retired potentially? Is it demographically constrained? Is it based off of any particular industry issue? Are things getting too expensive? Is childcare getting too expensive? And one parent has to remain at home. There's not a lot we can extract from this, but it is um, surprising because we were we were kind of holding at this slightly higher 62.8% rate. We'll wait a month or two and see if it's an aberration or if it's a trend. Now, wage growth in general. One of the things that has been really interesting to watch over the last few years has been wage growth. Wage growth has accelerated up to 4.1% per year. You're like, well, 4% a year in salary. I haven't seen that growth, or maybe you have. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it is fairly good and fairly towards the sort of long-term averages that we might expect in a growing economy. Of note is that wage growth exceeds inflation, even though not by a significant amount, inflation was up about 3.4% in the last year, wage growth is up 4.1%. That is a real increase in wages. When real increases in wages are high over the long run, that can be a factor in inflation, but I'm not seeing that at these num numerical levels now because it's 4%, 5% instead of 2%, 3%. Um, so 4%, so 5% is really a number in wage growth for real wage growth that would anticipate or, or lead me to suspect that we're getting into a position where wages will start driving inflationary issues. Um, right now, it's just not there. Um, so it's a really, really, really interesting, interesting point. So don't be worried about wage growth embrace wage growth. And the good news about wage growth is if we are headed for a soft landing, as it seems like we are, it means that wage growth will, um, that exceeds in general, if it's widely spread out between many Americans, will help Americans uh, improve their fiscal position with regards to things that continue to deteriorate, like auto loan delinquencies, other delinquencies related to debt and other indebtedness measures that we have. So longer wages over a high period of time, we expect this to create some benefits in the debt market, benefits in the household perspective. So it is noted um, as well, one interesting fact for your next uh, bar trivia night 
is we have about $140 trillion of household wealth in the United States right now. So December jobs report up 216,000. Again, following a long trend downward from 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic where we lost a ton of jobs and gained a lot back. Unemployment though has, has been fairly level. It's been up and down a little bit. This is more or less full employment. Average hourly pay up 4.1%, which is a nice positive trajectory. Now, we're not really in a recession. Is it a recession? Is it could be a recession? It's not really a recession. So, so right now, this is really very much a better than expected economy in the last year. In any measure that we look at recessions uh, for things like real consumption, um, uh, GDP growth, um, gross uh, domestic investment, uh, other things that become really valuable metrics, um, are strongly positive from where we were uh, way back when in the uh, uh, in the early parts of 2021. Um, uh, GDO is called gross domestic output. Uh, that's another way to look at um, economic size and economic power. That's also up. Employment's strongly up. Non-farm payrolls are up. Real manufacturing and trade sales are weaker, but <clears throat> that has a lot to do with, say, the strength of the dollar and other things, too. Albert points out it feels like a recession for a lot of people. And the BLS revising jobs numbers down and is revising the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics is keeps revising job numbers downward too. That is an accurate statement. So it is not as strong as, as, as I think it is. And it's very sector based. It is not something I'm arguing in any way, shape or form that it's uh, uniform and indica indicative of strength. It is a very strong recovery, but there are significant headwinds that we're gonna talk about ahead. Um, Jesse says, will Dr. Wright be talking about why job numbers keep being restated every three months? Yes. So Jesse, a lot of times when we get the preliminary numbers, so the jobs numbers as we know them come from employment-based surveys. Um, and these surveys go out and they provide some uh, context into uh, uh, you know, the nature of the jobs market. It's statistically sound in the sense that the sample size is big enough that it reflects and can be broadly reflective of the US economy as a whole. So one big question you always get is why do these job numbers ultimately keep being reinstated? Um, and you know, this happens to, this is adjustments that are made as more information is, is available and more information that was either previously not part of the original release that is able to be adjusted for certain economic situations that people didn't, didn't fully understand or they feel like there are statistical aberrations within this issue. So they fix it, <laughs> but they fix it hopefully to be more accurate. Look at this, Aaron with all the good California. This is very interesting. Did California enter a recession last fall? Great link. On the other hand, I always love it when numbers are revised upwards. I also do too. It's like, congratulations, your pay has been revised upwards. It's like a bank error in your favor. Meanwhile, if you've got this other situation and you're like, oh, it's been it's been revised downwards, it's it's very depressing. I'm working on that now. We have a challenging issue in my university, which I, I have an administrative role, unfortunately. And one of the issues is we're trying to get uh, people charge the right amount for tuition. And there'll be people who'll end up being charged, uh, who are charged too little that will then get a bill for more money, which makes me very angry and very depressed. So I'm hoping we get that fixed. But no one likes downward revision. And this is a sense that I think it's encapsulating to Jesse's point, uh, sort of the sense that the economy isn't necessarily as strong as it appears. Adjustments for these numbers when compared with other economic data is not good, but it will be noted that it still remains positive even with the corrections that have been made. And I fully expect these numbers to also be adjusted downward in some way, but it'll be interesting to see by how much in, in, in that case. So lower inflation, uh, uh, back to normal, strong GDP performance, especially in the third quarter. These are good news. Other indicators, kind of a mixed bag to your point. Headwinds, especially declining credit quality, indicate to me where seen the nadir of whatever direction is that we're going. And bank lending uh, right now has fallen off quite a bit. That's an engine for economic growth. And all the things show, even as you look on this graph, even though we're looking at improvement, we're reaching sort of a limit to that improvement. And that's a very interesting point. So this is interesting. When revisions downward are made, it could mean that. It could also mean other data to Albert's points. Albert asked, you know, when revisions downward are made, does this mean 
Uh, I mean, employers initially thought they would be hiring and then then didn't hire. Um, that is a possibility. It's also a possibility that you have um, additional economic data that is uh, particularly um, relevant to the job market values that they're creating. Um, it is a statistical interpolation of, of survey data and adding additional data in the sense that we always should add additional numbers whenever possible creates a better framework for us to evaluate the strength of the job market. So supplementing the survey data, you have additional data sources that have come out, all the monthly data releases from the Fed, uh, from, Fed uh, from the Fed and through the Federal Reserve Economic Data or FRED. You've got a whole stew of data that allows you to make these adjustments. So it's a whole bunch of things that are probably even above and beyond this, including employer decisions to do so. So why would an employer decide, for instance, that they wouldn't hire in the future? Um, a good thing is cost of investment. Whenever we have high interest rates, what it does is, so background is I always kind of talk about in these talks, what is the Fed? The Fed has the discount rate. The Fed makes one rate determination that's overnight lending to big banks. That's called the discount rate. But it has a ripple effect on all the other rates in the system. So for instance, when rates start going up in a huge magnitude, um, this increases the cost of investment for everybody. So that factory that was a good idea at low rates might not be a good idea at higher rates. And what that does is it helps reduce the money supply. And we'll show evidence that the money supply has been really effectively dropping in very meaningful ways. But let's talk about this. Do you feel confident as consumers? Do you feel particularly jazzed about the economy or are you kind of nervous? I always get, especially in this viewpoint, and not only just from the nature of, of the California economy itself, but there is a lot of anxieties out there and a lot of well-founded ones. And you're not alone. Consumer confidence index right now, although it remains higher than where it was, especially after the Great Recession, we're looking at levels that have been relatively disappointing this year. So even though uh, we saw that big drop off in 2020 in the recession, this sort of the shooting back of higher numbers following five trillion of stimulus spending 2021 and 22, that has since dropped off. And we're now kind of at like 2015, 2017 sort of levels for consumer confidence. And while it did shoot up last month, it's been far from being consistent in its availability of, in its ability to, to go upwards in any meaningful way. And also there's what we call, in, and this is my favorite chart from the conference board, the present situation and expectations in, index. So going back to the previous point about how people adjust job numbers, how is the present situation and what are your expectations? Right now, things are better than people expect them to be in the future, which is kind of alarmingly negative. In 2010, 2011, the opposite was the case. The expectations were that it would become better. And right now, the present situation index suggested that it was not. So though the expectations index is reflective of where people think from a confidence point of view, the economy is headed. The present situation shows we're actually doing pretty good, depending on the actual economic data at stake. So there is a discrepancy in what the data shows and what people feel it shows. So robust consumer spending has exceeded market expectations this year. That has been the story. 21% of consumers, 22% almost, said that business conditions were good. 41% said jobs were quote unquote plentiful. 41%, not a particularly good or, you know, and it's not a particularly overwhelming amount of percentage by any means. 36% of consumers say they'll be better off in six months, but only 12% believe it'll be worse in six months. People are still, generally speaking, more or less uh, optimistic about the economy. Now that we've determined, so Albert says, now that we've determined inflation was in fact transitory, why can't the Fed just lower rates? It ended up being a knee-jerk reaction over 18 months anyway. Good question. And that's why when the Fed came out, when Jay Powell came out back it last month and said, hey, three rate decreases in 2023 and the mar in 2024 and the market responded by saying the fed will reduce rates six, rate six or seven times instead um it implies that rate cut, rate cuts are indeed coming and we have not cut rates in a non-recessionary economy since 1998 that is how long it has been which is an extraordinary thing to do. So the fact that the Fed is doing it is itself an extraordinary measure um, in the sense that we're not in a recession. Charles writes, people in Switzerland appear to be confident on Bitcoin. Someone in Switzerland paid 30 bucks plus shipping for me to send a large Bitcoin plush. 
Good job, Charles. Oh, Charles, that's so great. I appreciate this. I like that you're either a manufacturer, a factor, or intermediary uh, artisan of Bitcoin-related plush paraphernalia. That amuses me greatly, and partially also because I, um, I've done some some of my published research in the last few years. I've been in cryptocurrency in some spaces. We built a model uh, with a, a former student of mine um, that looked at the profitability of crypto mining. It wasn't really as it turns out, but we we're the first people to look at it this way. Um, so we've done a few things that have been cool about it, and I gave a talk last Friday night um, at the new at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, and it was packed. And it was full of people about crypto and related Bitcoin and all these other things. So I appreciate this. People are in Switzerland are up here to be confident on Bitcoin. But the question is why? And again, when it comes to cryptocurrency, and the game is this, there are two, two ways we value things. Um, there's, you know, apart from, you know, we could speculate on the value of something. But two big things that affect cryptocurrency prices in particular, you've got fundamental value. You've got a maximum of 21 million Bitcoins and say uh, 19.6 million out there already. Uh, there's a shortage of supply. And then there's um, and the economic value of, is this going to be useful in some fundamental way, either because the blockchain will be utilized for some economic purpose, making uh, Bitcoin economically feasible, or is it going to be something that is... Um, uh, 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 not not able to do so. The other thing that value that crypto is valued on is hedonic value. Uh, he, he, think of hedonism, right? Hedonic value, the ability to value it because it brings you joy merely to, to possess this. So that's like me going and saying, buying Dogecoin, for instance. And um, while it serves no purpose, it might amuse me. Uh, but uh, the benefit is, is it brings me joy to buy it in the same sense that Paying $700,000 for an autographed Babe Ruth baseball brings people joy for buying it. It doesn't make it necessarily irrational. It's just a thing people do. Man, Aaron de los Reyes. Yes, the spot ETF, Dr. White. Yes, that's funny. So Aaron says, extra years 2020, 2021, and fiscal stimulus drove massive spending inflation, but it's back to a normal fiscal. You're absolutely right. So Aaron points out as well, and I don't want to dis distract from this through his link, um, we look at transfer receipts, government social benefits to persons, huge transfers in those years. And now it's gone back to trend, to Aaron's point. And PCE uh, has ripped by another 7 trillion, Aaron points out. And that is in, in no doubt huge. It is slowing this growth in personal consumption expenditures, uh, but it has been just spectacular to watch. Albert says, I hope you bought the run up to those spot ETFs. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I can't, I'm not going to, that's dead, but I kind of did. But uh, it's been very amusing for me. It's been very amusing to follow. I have to be, as a finance professor, I have to, if I'm, I am, uh, I'm only legit if I actually buy stuff that I talk to students about. So if I'm talking about crypto, I'm talking about ETFs, I, you know, I got to actually, you know, do the thing. That I talk about DeFi, I got to actually state currency and make that happen and, and put that on loan. So this is really interesting. So I appreciate this, and I'm a big fan of doing stuff if you talk about it. Uh, but one of the best parts is, is also economics, where you can just talk about anything. And there's a little accountability. So contending with spending. So another thing, too, which is really interesting, a lot of excess cumulative household savings that were derived from the pandemic. A lot of that has been spent off. But to our note now, but here's the, the, beautiful, the beautiful part of this. Even though we're, we've, we've, we've cashed most of our access savings through the system, there's some variance on, on what this means or how significant that was. Um, but um, the, if we can maintain real wage growth above inflation, that is itself going to contribute to improved savings and improved uh, economic and financial conditions. So that's good news. It is also worth noting, though, that if you do feel poorer than where you were before, even though real wages are rising, that's rational. We are still below trend if we go back to pre-pandemic. When we think about real disposable income, we're still we're still we're still we're still lagging it a little bit, especially as we end um, we start 2024. Um, so again, getting those real wages up will help those numbers increase further. Now, the other thing, when we talk about this as well, shenanigans that happened this year, things to think about. One of the one of the key moments of this year, in my opinion, was back in March, where we, of course, saw a regional banking crisis with Silicon Valley Bank, dun, 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 Signature Bank, and then, of course, First Republic Bank. Collectively, these three bank failures were greater in magnitude than the total bank failures we saw in 2008. But why was it not a collective national crisis? 
So a lot of times we saw, because the Fed increased rates so rapidly, uh, we saw a lot of banks who held treasuries, which are, of course, government bonds backed by the government's safe investments. But when they pay really low interest rates and the Fed raises rates, the price of those bonds dropped precipitously. And a lot of those bonds had unrecognized losses on the balance sheets of these banks. And it freaked a lot of people out, especially from a risk management perspective, that banks were now vulnerable and having all these treasuries and other securities that were long dated and lost tons of money because the Fed increased rates. And so what happened was you had a lot of uh, bank effective bank runs, people removing capital, especially uninsured capital from banks, forcing closures of a few big banks. Now, what the Fed did and the Treasury did right was they put together the bank term funding program, the BTFP, that helps stabilize markets. And if you don't believe me, so I had this conversation, I was giving this conversation to um, a, um, the, I give a, a uh, like a yearly update to, to the uh, banking association, the statewide banking association in New Mexico. And I was talking to some bankers there and they're like, we are in serious trouble in March. Um, you know, without this funding program, the number of bank failures would have been significantly greater, 100%. And it would have driven a, a, a stake through the heart of confidence in the financial system, which has taken so long to rebuild from 2008. And if we had done nothing, which I'm not saying was actually an option on the table, um, it would have resulted in a much more widespread crisis that may have resulted in enough job, job enough uh, loan uh, slowdowns, uh, capital slowdowns, and stress to the markets that we would have been in a recession in March. But we avoided this, and that is a key thing to remember. So this is a key point. The bank term funding program was hugely beneficial um, for a lot of banks, especially smaller banks that needed that capital line to stabilize markets. And that's where a lot of regular people bank. So we kept a lot of people from being affected, but under the sacrificial knife of you know, society's glare was signature uh, was a signature bank in Silicon Valley Bank. I I really think this, Aaron. I think it should win the 2023 Nobel Prize in Economics because recessions can start for colossally dumb reasons, and it would be colossally dumb for us to not intervene in a banking crisis in this way. But we did, and now we don't think about it, and we footnote it. But I just want you casually in the next, you know seven days when you think about it, tip your hat for the BTFP and only say that maybe this was a little bit beneficial this year. Colin says, does bailing out banks historically prove to be a moral hazard? Of course, bailing out banks is a moral hazard. But the problem is, it is also a, it is a phenomenal moral hazard. But the question is, 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 is rates your hazards? A collective uh, financial crisis that results in um, an aggregate loss of faith in the banking system is much more devastating to U.S. investment and the economic situation than um, bearing a few banks in risk, which makes regulatory action crucial for banks. It makes regulation critical to keep us from reaching that point. And then Colin says, should we expect banks to act recklessly in the future when they expect bailouts? That's a good question. So is this a reckless case is it a case of bad financial planning regarding the nature of de bond dating? Is it a combination of over-concentrating in uninsured deposits in ways that can't be maintained? It will force a lot of banks to reconsider their position. At the end of the day, the bank still failed, but many other banks survived and consequently restructured. And following 2008, if we look at at TARP, right, which was the Troubled Asset Relief Program in 2008, what they did is say, for instance, the government bailed out banks by bailing them out. They, they bought preferred stock in banks that the banks were then able to buy back from the government. And we actually made a slight profit off of this. So, so it is a significant issue, but I, I don't think it would be, um, you know, it is something we have to grapple with. And good regulation can help us through it. But I'm no friend of the, I'm not saying like, ah, let's be, let's start swindling widows and orphans for money. I'm not saying that in any manner either, Colin, because that's a really good point. What do you think, Colin? I'm, so there's a thing I saw a while back, which was someone graphed the amount of banks in the USA after the 2008 financial crisis. And if you just see a drastic decrease in the amount of banks that exist, and, yes. Um. I guess one of the follow-up questions I have is, are 
are banks consolidating pseudo monopolization power mm. and becoming yeah. more of a systemic risk as a result yeah. of all of these bailouts and uh i guess just being being too big to fail i hate that word and i hate that classification because if right. i find anything that's too big to fail shouldn't even exist or should have been broken up long ago <laughs> so i i i love this question and and i sent a link to the host and panelists which i don't think is visible to everybody but um in this um commercial banks in the united states we had over 14,000 commercial banks in the 80s. We have only 4,375 now, 4,000 now, basically 4,000 banks now. There it is. Thanks, Albert. So, so lost like this is a discontinued chart, by the way, but it's very nice to see because it shows a nice, a nice chart of, of its way downward. Now, to your question, this is a good question about why banks merge and is there there are um loan banking deserts across the country defined as um, areas that are insufficiently serviced by financial service firms. And there are many places in the country, especially uh, um, rural country counties that are, <laughs> I'm, on, I'm doing the best I can with the puns. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> but in this point of view, it is consolidation is reasonable up to a certain point. Um, at some point, you lose access to those community banks that provide financing in rural regions because they don't find it profitable to do so, um, especially in, in states. And I was talking to our banking sector, um, and we only have a population of 2.2 you know, 2 million in New Mexico. But in that case, you know, we have you know, something like 35 different banks that operate in different spaces. There's a move for consolidation here, and it's driven primarily by financial concerns and a desire to recognize economies of scale. Um, small banks feel outmatched. Um, they can't match depository arrangements. They can't match financial products. Smaller banks have a more difficult time engaging capital markets the way big banks can. The other aspect of this is to what point does it become bad? Do we need 14,000 banks? Do we need 4,000? You know, if we look at, say, consolidated banking systems, say countries like Germany, countries like Japan, they still have very effective banking systems, there are just fewer banks that service these elements. And, and the, the answer is, I guess, in short, is as long as there was sufficient competition to ensure that um, banks are continually evaluated in, in a competitive market where they can continually provide high quality services and in a competitive way against one another for the, um, for the population, and they're able to meet those needs, that's fine. So consolidation in itself isn't the enemy, but being able to provide reasonable financing and, and, and financing support for many parts of the country is. But a uh, story of hope. We have a whole bunch of non-traditional banking institutions and internet banks that are really um, giving the banks a run for their money, so to speak. Um, in a lot of respects. Oh man, and Aaron says, and that banking crisis would have knock on UB's Credit Suisse, The Rock Europe. Yeah, exactly right. It would have been a huge, that banking crisis, had it happened, would have affected, uh, it would have been a global thing. Will, will the change to the overdrafting fees cause a new banking crisis? Interesting question. So you're referring to, this one I do know about, um, I'm so sorry about the tax rules still. I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, but the bank, this one I was expecting. So overdraft fees are a multi-billion dollar portion of bank of the ways that bank make banks make money. And as we know, it's often, particularly for lower income folks, a very regressive way to make money. And often a very, of all the things banks do, it is often one of the most, most difficult to possibly defend. So I don't think it's going to kill the banking industry because banks are in a better capital, better capital position in this country now than they were in a significant way than prior to 2008. I'm, I'd be more worried globally, but there are so many ways for banks to make money right now, especially in capital markets, investing, all these other things. But I think it will force consolidation. And also, I think if you're running a bank and your profit margins do come from overdraft fees, you probably shouldn't be running a bank. Please consider other forms of financial services that don't charge uh, poor folks for being poor. Um, so it's a challenging environment to provide financial services. Now, this is one, this is right down Colin's alley. Colin sent me a special link about this one, and I wanted to weigh in about this rule too. Contractor rules, done, done, done. 
How many people in the United States engage in freelance work over the course of a year? Astoundingly, about 59 million Americans, about 40% of our overall workforce, um, look or are, are either paid partially or fully as independent contractors. And my guess is a proportion of the people in the audience today are also paid as independent contractors in some way. So the Biden administration is releasing some interest, some, some controversial rules that makes it more challenging to classify workers as independent contractors. Now, this will have some very interesting effects, Colin. And I got into details about this. I got into various debates with strangers at my university, uh, with, you know, people on the street. We had a great conversation about this, Colin. So thank you for sending me this link. So, uh, <laughs> if a com company wants to classify you as an independent contractor because it costs them less for operational costs. They have to do fewer things for you, um, in including the nature of how everything from your contract, taxes, how all of that stuff is set up, right? So if this is limited, it forces companies to say, wait a second, are you indeed an employee? And I, should I provide you the employee st stuff, the rights, benefits, and everything they're in? Or should I not hire you and hire an employee instead? And this is really, really interesting. So it could significantly impact industries who rely on contract workers. App-based services, so your Ubers, your Lyfts, all the other app-based services that rely heavily on contract work. Um, it's predicted to increase labor costs in various sectors for this reason. But what will it do? And this is a good question. Does it, it likely will decrease worker flexibility and also potentially increase operational costs for businesses. Now, the idea is, of course, that this isn't nefarious in a law. It's to provide workers who are often overlooked and not provided, um, and I'll zoom in for the cheap seats here, um, adequate employment coverage, certain employment rights, certain adequate access to certain benefits that, that people benefit. But how companies respond to this will be fascinating. And I don't know yet, depending on the nature of this, how this will work. So for instance, you've got who's an independent contractor. We've got literally almost every truck driver, writers, yoga and fitness instructors, they're artists, they're construction workers, they're barbers, they're healthcare workers, real estate agents. I mean, I, my guess is if we raised a hand in the audience here, you've worked somehow in some capacity, either through your main or side hustle in some capacity as an independent contractor, including myself. And so the implication is, is the question is, and this is really interesting, in, is are you as an individual economically dependent on the company? And if you are, they have to either make you an employee or and reclassify you, um, or <laughs> my fear, not hire you at all. You know, um, three and four independent contractors like being independent. 30% of freelancers choose to uh, chose to actually leave a full-time job for their freelance work. And so companies will be at this position now where they'll either have to acknowledge and recognize many workers as potential employees or accept that you're contractors, but then you'll have to somehow prove or otherwise indicate that you're not economically dependent on that company. And so I suspect there'll be shenanigans with this issue. I suspect that, you know, I'll be like, and, you know, so let's say I'm filling out a form, I'm working for like a consulting job that's like a minor hustle, like a side hustle. Like it's like, you know, we'll pay you X thousand dollars to do this work. And I go, okay. And are you independent? Are you, they'll ask me, Riley, are you economically dependent on us? And I'll go, no, I am not. I am a contractor. I'm not economically dependent. But then there'll be somebody who's like, uh, this is their one gig that year and it's a really big project. And they're like, are you economically dependent on us? And they'll go, no, even though they'll lie because they have to say no or indicate otherwise because they're worried about losing the gig if the company feels that um, uh, uh, this has all kinds of variables. If the company feels they're um, 
uh, or they're worried that if they are economically dependent and they admit it, uh, it'll go to some other firm that they can contract as an independent contractor and pay less money. And then you're looking at a question of, is this going to shift from small gig employers to larger companies that can prove that they can continue contractual work? Is this going to result in a consolidation of the gig industry? This is a lot of open questions to me that are actually going to be fascinating to play out. But it's a risky move in my in, in in this standpoint. Scott sent some excellent links, by the way. Wisconsin State Journal's two recent articles about bank fees. Very nice to read about. Billions of dollars in overdraft fees, making it hard for the banks. Aaron says this will transform in hammer tech. Agreed, as they have the same rule in Mexico, which Almo put in, oh, AL, ALMO put in in 2021 in most Mexico tech companies are shifting contractors offshore versus hiring in Mexico. Fascinating, Aaron. So Daniel said, so if your job is a side job and you can afford to lose it, you're cheaper to hire. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. Aaron's got some links here. Subcontracting restrictions, fascinating. I'm Albert curious. says, Heather writes, so, so many shenanigans are on everyone's future. Heather, it's raining shenanigans. Ooh, Charles asks, oh, that's a really good question. What do you guys think? Pick it to the audience. Is this going to override ABS? Albert shenanigans list. <laughs> I'm curious if uh, oh, offshoring the job to overseas means this rule doesn't apply. Well, we got to see what the rule looks like as they release it. That'll be interesting to see and how it's applied. Yeah. I mean, mm, assembly bill. You five. can't offshore DoorDash. That's true. AB5. <laughs> Hire independent contractors. This is really interesting, actually. So, Charles, your question is is this going to override? So, in the sense that federal laws override state laws, perhaps, but I'm not a legal expert in this field. I need to, to watch this. This is really interesting. Melanie, thank you for the link. So the gig worker bot, I remember this. I remember this. I think we talked about it back in 2020, actually, in Albert's List, in the ancient days. Um, this is fascinating because, and I guess my question would be is, how would I marry these two potential bills? Um, one from the Biden administration, one from the federal administration, and then one, of course, from the state level. And how would we equalize that? And I wonder if that will be sorted out in some capacity in, in the legal framework. Melanie, yes, what do you think? Melanie sees an opportunity for Infosys, Tata, ah, yeah, Tata, Tata to become vendors, employers uh, uh, of record to contract out to DoorDash. That is actually quite good. Melanie, that's excellent. I think that's probably likely in this scenario. Um, uh, that seems like... When you, as one of those situations where in business, if you shut a door, you know, you crawl out the window sort of situation or, or scramble up a chimney if you're in finance. Um, but one of the issues in particular is that you'll see these companies stepping in then to become effectively vendors um, uh, for other companies in this respect. And so it will and certainly have an effect on this market and quite a significant effect. And um, it will, you know, and, and I'm, I, you know, I have a mixed series of concerns in my own joy in seeing an expansion of the gig economy and seeing people being able to provide this, but also seeing a lot of people without benefits that are associated with those jobs. Uh, there's a lot of questions at play. Great question. I think this will be absolutely something that will come up. So moving on down here. And thank you, of course, for um, Assembly Bill 5 information too. That's solid. Oh, man. I suspect that it's too early to tell how those two will be intertwined as administration moves. But that is a great question. Man, you guys are great. Um, breaking the price, the war on inflation, or was it the war on inflation or merely a conflict of interest? So we know that inflation shot up to 9.1% back in uh, June of 2022. It has gone down since then. Now we're cruising at 3.1%, 3.4%, in fact, uh, in the most recent measure of slight increase. We're going to see some variation. Uh, average hourly earnings uh, up 4% in November, up 4.1% in December. So real wage growth is higher than inflation, and I suspect that inflation will continue to go down. FOMC projections, the Federal Open Market Committee, 
uh, uh, Federal Reserve open markets uh, estimate that perhaps it'll be 2025 before we hit that 2% target in the absence of a recession. But it will continually be variable. It's going to be heavily driven by energy from time to time, depending on variables uh, that will see some flex. It won't be solidly downward, but the trajectory will continue to go downward, especially as the economy continues to slow. So things that are happy that have happened in the last couple of years to talk about. Commodity prices are falling. Yay, one part where we do see deflation in the economy. Deflation, by the way, not desirable for the economy as a whole because it decreases our incentive to invest. We like just a teeny bit of inflation when we can, but um, deflation for commodity prices have been a boon for a lot of uh, manufacturers. Unit labor costs have spiked uh, during the recession, but have now basically reversed. Supply chain pressure has subsided to normal levels. Supply chains, of course, being a big factor in 2022, now that's gone back to basically normal. And of course, if you're big on the money supply, a shrinking money supply has been very effective. Money supply has gone down considerably. All that means that points to continued direction for lower inflation in the next couple of years. Now, we have, this is another question we received from the Albert's List group. How much influence do you think changes in the Gini coefficient will have? meaning to the overall economy. So here's the thing, Gini, what is it? G-I-N-I, -I. what sign of shenanigans are this? So imagine you're trying to map out how unequal a population is. So this is a scale that runs from zero to one. And to understand this, you can read about Lorenz curves and other things that help provide a context for how the Gini coefficient works. If you have a Gini coefficient of zero, you are a completely equal economy. There is no differentiation. Everybody is equal in every way for their income. If you have a Gini coefficient of one, a single person earns all the income. Everybody else earns nothing. So that is the situation. You have absolute inequality. So one is absolute inequality. Zero is absolute equality. So where does the United States fit? terrible relative to other developed nations in the sense that our Gini coefficient is kind of high. In general, over the last 30 years, our Gini coefficient has in fact risen, um, rising from 0.45 to 0.49, um, which is a substantial increase. However, and this was pointed out by the person, and this was the, the, the basis of their question, one good effect that the COVID-19 pandemic had was that our Gini coefficient dropped for the first time in years. Um, to get a sense of this, will this affect the markets as a whole? Not in, in the sense that Gini coefficient has dropped, but not enough to demonstrate huge changes in the way that we view, spend, and allocate resources in the country. And indeed, when we think about dropping Gini coefficients, we're now at a level that we may have seen, say, back in 2015, but it's nothing to be particularly impressed about yet. The IMF is pretty clear about this, and there's a lot of research to support. Excessive inequality um, erodes social cohesion, leads to political polarization, lower economic growth. But there are some factors at play here that are worth talking about that makes this less clear. Albert uh, points out a question from Lucy. Lucy writes regarding Section 174. Read this on Hacker News. Will U.S. companies hire fewer engineers due to Section 174? Um, as far as I understand it, software engineering salaries are no longer fully tax deductible in the year they are paid. Instead, they're only depreciated by 20%. Tiny part of a Trump era tax bill that went into effect very recently. Interesting. So that is actually going to that, that is going to have a, a substantial business effect, particularly in the way that businesses go out and hire, uh, for instance, engineers or software engineers, as you as you demonstrate here. So having fully tax deductible software engineers allows um, many companies, as they approach their budgetary planning scenarios, um, to look at the hiring situation. And when you do any budgetary planning, as many of you have done in your companies, you know that part of that role is to provide some, oh gosh, you have to provide some um, um, relative, it's impossible to be certain, relative guidelines and certainty involving the additional costs any job line um, you create has relative to where the company's growth potential is, where the unit growth potential is, and it can be very complex. So the tax deductibility of this was no doubt significant in the ability to hire the engineers aggressively for firms. Now, depreciating them 20% is not as advantageous for a lot of firms, 
But taken a different way, depends on who's doing the hiring. You have startup companies with, um, say, uh, negative cash flows already. They aren't going to be heavily focused on questions like tax deductibility when they already possess very little tax um, a very small or non-existent tax bill because they're they're losing money. Um, larger companies, though, heavily profitable companies, big tech companies, of course, I could see them making hiring decisions that are affected by this. And it doesn't um, help, particularly given the context of the tech-related losses that we've seen lately. Aaron has a great link, too. List of U.S. states and territories by income inequality. Oh, this is fun. So what is the most unequal uh, U.S. territory in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is number one, followed by New York, District of Columbia, Connecticut, Louisiana, California, right there at number seven. Um, most equal state, Utah, interesting, but still 0.42, which is pretty high by global standards. So very interesting stuff. Colin says, does IMF statement there apply to the current wealth gap? <laughs> hmm. I would, that's a good question. Although not referring to that statement, they're referring merely to the inequality of incomes in this respect. There's a separate inequality involving the inequality of wealth that you point out, Colin. And um, a lot of the research is supportive of, 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 of that as well. And there is a high level of, a high but imperfect level, as we all know, of, um, Correlation between wealth and income, but they're very different things. For sure. So as we know, anybody who got that first job out of college, right? Hot, you suddenly are you're maybe five years down the line, you're earning a lot of money, but it's going out the window to pay for your rent and other things. So your wealth is is also very poor. So, so it's an interesting thing. What wealth? <laughs> what wealth? It is hard. So interesting parts about rates. So <laughs> the yield curve remains inverted. This has predicted a recession in the last eight years. The yield curve is a connection of all the U.S. bond yields uh, from one month to 30 years out. Normally, it's upward sloping. That implies growth. It's downward sloping. That implies recession. So the question is, when the j Powell came out in December and said, hey, there's going to be rate cuts, the long-term rates all dropped, making it even more inverted. And so even if the Fed were to drop this left-hand portion of this chart, this blue line, when the Fed lowers the discount rate, that lowers short-term rates, and this follows along with it, it's likely the whole curve will follow too. So our hope is that although this has preceded a recession in every recession in the last 60 years, maybe not this time, question mark, sometimes it can be right for the wrong reasons. We had an inverted yield curve in 2019 before the pandemic. Did it predict the pandemic? No, but there are underlying concerns about the bond market that is worth watching. And I don't think we're fully out of the woods yet. j Powell indicated December three rate cuts were possible. That market said, you said three, you meant six. And some analysts now are suggesting over 2% or more in rate cuts, which will benefit a lot of hiring and investment down the line if done well. Issues in the economy. This year has been about, despite all the good news, we've had rising bankruptcies. Chapter 11 commercial bankruptcy filings up 72% in 2023. Higher rates and higher defaults are expected to continue through 2024 because rates are high, investments are high, a lot of companies. Although, interestingly enough, small businesses, when they asked what their most pressing economic problem was for their business, most of them said in the recent in a recent survey, a majority of them said it was inflation. Only a small amount, like five percent, said it was high interest rates. Colin, I saw your hand. I'm sorry. I, wasn't <laughs> hearing you. I I just going back to the inverted yield curve thing. Uh, does the NBER usually declare a recession as it's happening? <laughs> or after it's happened <laughs> so usually so usually there that's a really <laughs> that's a really good question so like i know the nber i love the nber um Aaron, the national bureau of economic research very excellent group of trained economists with magical gavels that say recession and then they go nah, we're in one and then they go we're not in one 
So they look at a bunch of, of, of data that follows through this, including say, historically, there's the old adage, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, but it's much more than that. It involves a lot of things about the job market and other things. So they're gonna make a call. They'll tell you when we are in a recession approximately, but they'll adjust and know for sure after we've been in it for a while because data is complex and there's a lot of variables at play. It's not always as evident. And in the last case that they were evaluated on this in 2020, this was you know self-evident. And then before that, it was 2008 and you gotta go back to 2000, simply not enough data points. <laughs> Charles asks, I love Charles's questions. In addition, I like, were you, were you, uh, you know, this is a good, I don't know if they were buying, did you get a lot of uh, plush, uh, Bitcoin plushes sent to Davos? Because that'd be really interesting. That would be like a market sensing uh, mechanism, Charles. How credible are economic discussions at Davos? So they're pretty credible in the sense that a lot of smart people are there. <sighs> Do a lot of smart people make mistakes on the economy? Yes. Did we have a consensus projection that we'd have a recession this year and we didn't happen? Also, yes. Um, is Davos a, I'm just bitter because no one invites me at the, to the World Economic Forum, uh, but <laughs> I'm trying to think, you know, it is an important place, but if, if you're, you're not looking, there, it's not worth going to. You know, <laughs> if you want to read cutting edge stuff, look at the data, you know, look at, what people are saying everywhere, take a lot of other principled ideas. Um, one issue I have with the economics field in general is that um, it can be an echo chamber. You can listen very comfortably to a lot of very elite voices in this space with very impressive educational characteristics. That um, uh, at one forum I was at, I um, heard a speaker speak and I listened to them and I thought, my goodness, this person has never spoken with somebody who like bags groceries for a living. And I was astonished at their lack of ability to understand like regular folks. So the economy is everyone. And I think, I think diversifying your opinion and looking to a broad scope of resources outside of Davos is great. But if you get a free ticket over there and you, you got like a stand, you're running like a hot dog cart full of Bitcoin plushies, I think you might make some money. Labor matters, as old as the skills. So we're looking at the post-pandemic economy characterized by more jobs available than physical unemployed people. This is still the case, although the level of total job openings has been declining and the number of total unemployed people has been going up slightly or remaining relatively stable. So why are there so many openings and, uh, and, and still so many unemployed people? people. And the question is, as we look at this as a skills mismatch, an industry mismatch, a sector mismatch. And it's not the same. Leisure and hospitality and government remains robust for hiring. Financial sector and information sector also have been very disappointing. Now we got a whole bunch of other questions you guys asked, and I'll try to do my best to go through these with various tomfoolery and whimsical adages. How will the presidential election affect the job market? Incidentally, there isn't a huge effect on presidential elections in the overall job market. It does shift resources towards these massive campaigns and the people that populate them. But there isn't a huge amount of data that suggests it affects, say, the economic conditions itself, meaning the election itself. The policies of the president-elect is effective. But I also want to note that even then, after election market movement, and this is an article by Chen, uh, at Al in 2016, Shen, uh, a progressively been more accurate in, in, I'm sorry, an after election market movement has progressively been more accurate in predicting the future GDP growth, but not future unemployment rates. So if you want to figure out what happens in the election or what the economy, where the economy is going to go, you can follow and see what the market does, but the market will predict GDP, but not unemployment really well. Also, the stock market returns between elections. And this was a study that came out that studied a bunch of different data. When we look at this, uh, year one post-election, the average stock market return is around 8.3%. Midterms are always very disappointing. Uh, year three, which is the year we just came out of, 2023 in this case, uh, strong years for market growth. Uh, Pre-election, it tends to be okay. But in pre-election, we also see a large amount of downside risk. 
So things to think about. In your opinion, what are the reasons the high-tech industry continues to downsize? So first and foremost, you're correcting for over-hiring from the pandemic era. Online activity surged. Uh, you saw at that time, at the beginning of the pandemic, still very low interest rates. Investing and making investments for the future was cheap. And consequently, people could hire folks. Now, um, uh, growth projections have been recalibrated. And, <laughs> and investor pressure is forcing um, companies, especially in a high interest rate environment, to be very careful about the way they invest in different things. So Aaron says, zombie zerp bacorns, zombie zerpacorns, I'm sorry, zombie zerpacorns are zombie unicorns that would probably worth dramatically less. Who invented these words? Uh, I know unicorns, <laughs> zombie zerpacorn um, would probably be worth dramatically less than 1 billion, if not for the COVID zerp era multiple. Wow, Aaron, you're just zombie zerpacorn. You've coined a word. <laughs> that no one will use. Uh, Melody, I love it. And this hiring right. I know you can hug Mar Marsha, this is funny. I can't stop giving about the Bitcoin plushies in this hiring environment. I can hug it, but not my Bitcoin. I know it becomes a manifestation of the unrealized, unrealized crypto investments that you may have made. I love it. With um, so anyway, uh, high tech industry continues to downsize. Investors are demanding better uh, returns. They're more careful in sections where interest where where interest rates are high. Um, investment decisions have to be more carefully considered. And of course, you looked at all of the hiring that happened during COVID and overexpansion of hiring that led to this decline. Is this chronic for the industry? No. Part of the deal with the Bay Area and with tech in general is that it is always going to be cyclical. And the key is, of course, to get in on and make sure the investment environment is strong enough to encourage and build that next series of companies down the line. And even though you're looking at departures of VC and other places to other parts of the country, the Bay Area still commands a dominant approach here. So which high tech jobs are more resilient to layoffs? Good question. So here, I want you to also take in other considerations if you talk to recruiters and people on the ground. So here we have some things. So right now, so one thing that surprised me last year in the academic space was that we saw um, a lot of um, uh, business schools close or partially suspend things like their cybersecurity programs, which I found really interesting because we have a wealth of data that suggests that cybersecurity in particular are um, particularly perceived to be resilient to layoffs because of uh, its absolute necessity across many different firms, many organizations, and the research required within it um, to preserve security and encryption within individual information um, stored by companies across the board. IT, tech jobs within resilient industries, things like healthcare. You're in tech, but you're also in, say, <laughs> tech health, health tech, you're good. You should be okay um, to the layoff segment right now, because even if you are laid off from whatever firm is trying to pinch, pinch pennies, you're very likely to get a good hire, a, a good position outside of here. Um, but a lot of this has been said before, and that's really interesting. <laughs> Aaron, that's my history. Make words that see are so stupid. They mean something. I love it. 1300 unicorns, Aaron points out with upside down cap tables. That's huge. Trillions of zombies or pecorns that have trapped hundred thousands of Bay Area workers with options that are upside down. Fascinating. So this is really interesting. So um, again, referring to this to people who might be listening to this without a graphic or the benefit of reading the websites or or, or perhaps Aaron's comments. Um, uh, unicorns, of course, are startup companies worth more than a billion bucks. And so there's a lot of times where a lot of these startup companies aren't really worth that much. And especially given the change in the economic environment since the company may have gone public or otherwise formed, um, you're looking at a vastly different economic situation for a lot of these firms. And that makes them less attractive and makes a lot of VCs vulnerable. Upside down in options is terrible, by the way. I know a lot of people, when you look at firms, you're looking for a startup firm, you're compensated in ways involving things like options that may or may not pay off or make their money down the line. And sometimes you're working, you know, um, like my sister, a good example of this, who I love dearly, uh, works for a startup company. And I, I really hope 
um, that she maximizes this, but a lot of her compensation is in the form of options too. And when you run into challenges, like during the pandemic, you start questioning your life choices and saying, why, why did I take this job that only pays me an option? Um, very difficult. I'm hoping she gets to exit two hours and then, you know, and then she can, you know, fund my, she can give her brother a boat. Um, given the recent layoffs, what can we expect in terms of hiring for H1 and H2 in 2024? So first half and second half of 2024, I think we're going to see periodic layoffs throughout the financial services industry, throughout uh, um, the um, tech industry. But a lot of this will depend on when the Fed makes the pivot and how big the pivot is. Because if the Fed communicates they're serious about reducing rates, and we don't see a comeback in inflation and companies start growing more comfortable with investment, I wouldn't be, I would be very pleased to see more of this result in um, long-term uh, jobs that not only we see fewer layoffs than we see hirings, um, which is still an optimistic perspective. Do you expect more positions in final services, financial services to be available? No, <laughs> no, no, not like this. And coming in this perspective, this is a good question. Uh, the investment management industry in particular, conditions have really deteriorated since 2021. A lot of people, the optimists, are being outnumbered by the pessimists. And because hiring is determined by the pessimists in various managerial roles, I suspect that it's going to be a continued a hard slog ahead. They look at the regulatory environment. They look at the, com the competition from non-traditional financial securities firms. There is always money to be made, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't select a financial services career field, but it will mean that you should consider upskilling and considering other ways for you to value yourself within this market. Um, oh, man, he anticipated my quest point. Aaron says, get a CFA, MBA financial management, three-year hell, but will separate yourself big time. Agreed. CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. Don't just put level one candidate under there, but, and I served on the CFA Society of uh, New Mexico on their board for a number of years. And I also um, got our university to become CFA affiliated. So we had to align our curriculum in certain ways. But the big picture on this is that a CFA is good. CFP, if you're into financial planning and that's your and that's your jam, that's good. Um, three tests for the CFA though. Uh, level ones just came in with a 35% pass rate. It is a hard test. Do your best with it, though. Study for it. Study at least 300 or 400 hours for it. But it does pay off. And even having level one on there has gotten people through the door and gotten people jobs. How do you foresee recent economic changes impacting job seekers in the San Francisco Bay Area, especially those in the tech industry? Are there any distinct trends um, evolving while navigating this evolving landscape? So there's been a lot of noise, a lot of interesting things. And while there's been a lot of attention on this, I don't think it's cashed out by any means. Green tech, health tech, that's where it's at. I think there's going to be a lot of future involving a lot of that. Um, I think there's a lot of incentives this way that are agnostic to the question of presidential elections, just doing business and making things happen. Um, networking, adaptability, and continuous learning are all critical pieces uh, of this process. And you already know this. Networking is good. Adaptability is good. Continuous learning is good. Network, network, network. You can find me on LinkedIn. You know, you can search through my contacts. If I can connect you to anyone, let me know. Um, but um, but keep posted, keep me posted on these things and let me know if you have questions in this environment. Uh, Kushbu, uh, want to know your views on the scope of FRM certification. So FRM certification is highly regarded in risk management, FRM. And this is key too. You want to provide the right, right certification for the right job point of view that you have. If you're financial planning, a CFP is just as good as a CFA. For a generalized financial discussion involving investments, operational, if you're being a CFO, a CFA is the way to go. If you're in the space where you're in some level of risk management or financial risk management, um, that is an excellent certification that is uh, that allows you to distinguish yourself meaningfully to it. The exam is challenging, um, and it is a great overlap, particularly if you're you know, in some kind of financial risk management field. Oh, that's so nice. Um, does Dr. White know anybody at big banks? I do, but I don't know if they're hiring. Um, direct line to Jamie. Yeah, he doesn't take my calls anymore, Jamie Dunn. Uh, Lucy writes, Dr. White makes me feel more hopeful. I'm good. You should be more hopeful. There's anything we can do as long as we got... We got, we got, as long as you got runway on your road, meaning in your career pathway, you can upscale and do things meaningfully to improve your position. And even then it's not a catastrophe. Um, so, and the next one, a couple quick things. I had this really, really beautifully worded question. Grind, 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 said Aaron. 
You can work for the Delos Reyes firm. Uh, uh, he'll provide you some context and uh, he'll fund uh, uh, one half of 1% of your CFA uh, level one exam. Uh, how can a collaborative effort between big businesses, philanthropy, government, and community organizations be strategically implemented to encourage profitable corporations to contribute to initiatives and projects fostering opportunities and wealth building uh, uh, for uh, communities, black, indigenous, and other people of color communities, uh, ultimately creating a culture of giving back and addressing the undeniable correlation between violence and employment. Bam, bam, bam. That's a, that's a medal winning question. So I got to level with you at the end of the day. Public part, private partnerships with the government as a facilitator that offers clear incentive structures. So that's key. So you actually got to produce some type of public private partnership. We can have like a whole like session about this because in our community here um, in Albuquerque and other places, we've got successful initiatives like this and unsuccessful ones. Um, it's not enough even in that case. You need establishment and training, mentorship and entrepreneurial support. That doesn't exist in all places and it's thin. It is thin in places where it's needed the most. And so developing good organizational capital will help this space. Opportunity zones, Aaron, yes, with, with extra bounce, exactly right. All the things, it's gotta be all the things. It's, it's gotta be a whole bunch of things to make this work. If Wall Street is doing so well, inflation is going down, and the country's added millions of jobs since the last election, why are jobs so hard to get? I've been out of work for 10 months, and I know many others who have been looking for a while. Exactly. That's why you're part of Albert's List, and that's why Albert's List is so critical. So different industries, different strokes for different folks. Uh, quit rates and hiring rates. Um, while hiring rates remain higher than quit rates this year in general, um, different industries are easier to get jobs in than others. If you're looking at an accommodation in food services, they'll probably want to hire you. You'll probably also want to quit that job, but they'll probably want to hire you. Arts, entertainment, and recreation. Sizable quit rate, sizable hiring rate relative to quit rate. Here on this side, though, look at the bottom left of the graph where you have low hiring rates and low quit rates. It's information sector and financial activities. So if you're in wholesale trade, financial, or information, you're looking at the markets that have seen the most stress and it's most challenging to hire. Do not give up. Should you all become actors? <laughs> Yes, I, collectively, everybody will be singing waiters. Yes, Melanie. So many singing waiters. Uh, show tunes, whatever it is you want. Oh, great. There's not enough of that at um, Applebee's. So labor mobility is my favorite. Why don't we sing? I thought these were two. This is a fancy joint. Aaron says uh, labor mobility is very low. Almost nobody moves to work. That's also true. Oh, yeah, there's more. there's more here, isn't there? I buried it. Do you envision, and this is another one, people, I love these questions. You guys went all out on the questions. Do you envision current, current shareholder capitalism in the USA will be changing to a more equitable form of capitalism as well as working towards fewer monopolies? Interesting question. So this is the downside of capitalism. So capitalism is still a really good way um, to allocate resources within an economy, probably the best way we found, but with severe problems attached to it. So the question is, when we look at shareholder capitalism in the USA in particular, well, capitalism in general, it is free markets don't always work. Um, and often they tend towards oligopolies. And regulation, if it's carefully constructed and effective, will keep oligopolies from forming, allowing markets to remain free and equitable. But it's very difficult to maintain that consecutively over a very long period of time. Um, it is true that we need to maintain, to maintain a free market economy, we have to balance that with regulation that is not excessive, but meaningful in keeping markets free. Um, examples in this sector. Um, oligopolies are themselves, people defend oligopolies. I don't think it's defensible because it's a failure of a market system. It's a market failure. Uh, you have a situation where you have a few companies that are able to effectively dictate price controls in different areas. So the question should be ultimately, how do we make things more fairly priced and freer in this situation when we can, but that's only possible within certain limits. So I suspect at some level, it'll be some balance between stronger regulatory action on oligop oligop oligopolistic forms. It's highly 
relevant on you know the nature of presidencies, uh, presidencies and all that stuff. But I suspect it will be some kind of combination where we will have to decide as a country what we do about everything from government expenses to healthcare and the nature of what we think about all of these things, because it is a uh, um, hmm. it is a solvable problem. But we have to, in good faith, also make um, ex expenditures at government levels more efficient, but also provide better services. So that, I think, is going to be the 21st century game. Efficiency in government, followed by an expansion of services, and also a, um, and as Aaron points out, we don't have consistent transparency and horizontal market analyses. You're right. Not all markets. Some markets are freer than others. Retail is freer. Healthcare is less so. <laughs> How do we fix it? How do I stay positive and motivated after a year of unemployment? Remember, and this is a good one too, you have value. You're not defined by your job. Your job is part of who you are, but it isn't you. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Use every opportunity as a learning experience and realize that you have an opportunity to get a job somewhere, anywhere, at any time. It's not always, it's not certainly not a reflection of you as a person, not less than. You're a valuable human being that's worthwhile and keep trying. Um, and also consider other things and other factors. As much feedback as you can, do not lose hope. Do not lose hope. Um, Albert says, can we look at this from an economics and incentives point of view? How can one become motivated still? Ooh, motivated from an economic standpoint. So Albert, you know, this is really interesting. So what, how do we measure our success as folks? You know, one of the things when as people, as human beings, um, and this depends on your life philosophy, which depends on a whole bunch of different things. Aaron has some good ideas, volunteer on small, small local businesses, nonprofit schools in your skill area. Get them to write you up on LinkedIn and use it as a killer CV resume. I think that's a great job. I think incentives to play like an overarching 30,000 foot view. View it as a cycle of continuous improvement. That's how we determine accreditation for business schools and other things. And uh, continuous improvement is I think a pretty good life philosophy too. Um, it allows you to think, how are you improving and how are you evaluating those things? And if you can say you can get better, either in the ways that Aaron suggested, in the ways of the skills that you produce and those things, you've made progress, um, even if you haven't gotten the dream job you wanted. Oh man, real estate recap. <laughs> Aaron's got all kinds of things. Become an Excel monster, macros, VBA. Literally, with any of those things, you can do it. And I will argue that, to Aaron's point, um, a little bit of elbow grease, a little bit of push, you can do it. Like, it's it, you know, it's something anybody here in this audience, you guys are asked such brilliant questions. Um, I would feel confident about anybody being able to do that. I always feel sad, though. And I want to acknowledge your feelings. And I want to actually understand that, you know, when you approach the situation, and you're looking at motivating something after a period of long loss to not lose your sense of value and purpose. And know that that... Um, there, you have um, so much within you as a as a person. I can't find of anybody unemployable. I have a nine year old son. I think he'd be pretty handy in a coal mine. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's on. I know no child labor in this house. I promise. Uh, but uh, Albert says, but how much will AI take over these jobs? And I go back to this. And so another article came out and said, oh, 40 percent of jobs are at risk of being replaced by AI. There is the risk that AI will replace your job, and also, but here's the point. There are so many barriers in place for that prevent revolutionary change from occurring in the workplace. You're going to be okay in the short run. Um, during the next recession, people will be laid off and not hired back in the same sectors because of AI and whatever technologies are out there. And as a good example to this, think of telephone operators. Um, we developed, remember, there used to be a time, no one remembers, remember back in 1897, Remember when you're calling in the telephone operator and you're like, oh, you have to you have to dial somebody else and say, operator, please connect me to so-and-so. And there had to be a person who had to connect you to so-and-so. And in the 1920s, we developed the technology that allowed us to um that allowed us to not need that anymore. But 
people were still hiring telephone operators until the 1980s. And so it took 60 years between the advent of a technology that replaced this issue and the full elimination of that technology from the day-to-day -day workplaces. That's really good. You were just getting so wholesome, Dr. Wright. I know, Albert. I know you talked about AI. Uh, AI will not will not take over dynamic business decision operations in the real world. I believe that, Aaron, at least in the short run. Alice says, and if you're an expert in those things, that doesn't mean the work just shows up to make money as an Excel monster. You have to know where to market yourself. Excel monster, a billboard on the highway somewhere in Oakland. Uh, Aaron says, all the BSAI pessimism is not realistic. I agree too. I think that people are pessimistic about it. I think it's actually more hopeful in the sense that it will help um, a, a level the playing field for a lot of job market folks. We know that research has come out and has shown this consistently, that AI doesn't uh, improve the performance of top performing workers a lot, but lower performing workers, it improves a big margin. That's good news for firms, good news for people, and good news for, say, lesser skilled workers who are trying to get through the day to day and not trying to get hung up on, on grammatical errors or something like this. Uh, so anyway, mortgage rates peaked in October. I think they're headed downward and they're headed downward in a mean way and a good way. But historically low housing inventory has kept houses for high, price, uh, has kept prices for housing high and the new buyer's affordability index reached the worst level on record. So if you bought a new house this year, congratulations, this is the worst time to do it <laughs> from an affordability standpoint. But low inventories are the issue. Supply issue, by the way, are present in all of the developed world, but particularly present in English in English speaking countries. English speaking countries have, and this is a graph from the Financial Times, have been far worse in increasing housing supply than other nations. And consequently, because supply for housing has been low, they've seen huge price increases. So you have this, this is the the area of, of danger over here in the bottom right of the chart, you've got um, low levels of, of dwelling uh, development and, um, and low levels of building. Um, but you've got in East Asia, for instance, robust growth from a low base. And then in developed Europe, you've got like Portugal, France, and Finland, they've been able to, con to continue to build at rates that have allowed their markets to remain under control. Real things about GDP growth, it's uneven in a lot of places. A lot of the GDP drivers between 2019 and 2022, 2022 were driven by superstar cities that had huge growth in places like Texas. But also notice, even in the Bay Area in California, we're looking at some variations here. Disappointing growth in Marin County, not surprising. But down south on the other side, East Bay growing at a relative rate, Silicon Valley still flying high. As, a, as an engine of growth in, in the country as a whole between 2019 and 2022. So considering some things as I wrap this up, I've already taken too much time. So American businesses, economic uncertainty is at its lowest level since 2020. That's good news. Both September and December, FOMC participants indicated there was a decline in uncertainty. In other words, this marks a shift, not arcs a shift, from the last four years of prevalent economic uncertainty. Will a drop in interest rates encourage new hiring? Absolutely. And that's our hope what will happen. If interest rates drop, businesses become more certain, investment returns, we can turn this into a growth economy. The FOMC lower inflation, lower interest rates, and steady GDP growth through 2025, all the economic projections in general show uh, if we get through this year, we should be okay. <laughs> regarding our potential growth trajectory, which is good. Other things to concern about. I can't just give you positive news. If you've stuck around this long, you spent an hour and a half with me, that's almost enough to OD. Internal rates of concern. Household debt is still rising as it turns out. And although it's not at alarming rates, delinquency rates on credit cards and auto loans basically show me that the things are not always sunny. Um, in various Philadelphias. So retail spending has proven robust since 2020, but as we notice with the return of student loan repayments, the 25 to 34 group, and these are graphs from Joe Politano, uh, 25 to 34 uh, spending group in retail spending dropped even as um, other areas uh, uh, started to rise. And I suspect that this will be uh, a challenging trajectory in the next year. Another thing here as well, investment trends, 
Surges in AI-related investments are huge. Applications across healthcare, education, logistics, VC in investment in generative AI. Lukewarm for much of this period, 2023 was a banner year. Let's see how that pays out. Also, I think one story that's worth looking at is infrastructure investment, energy, transportation, and digitization. It's going to continue to grow, and the energy mix is going to continue to grow, reaching some level of uh, clean energy, uh, but also clean energy abundance will be key in the next few years. Some data, breaking it down locally, San Francisco and San Jose. Although you can't read this in the cheap seats, or if you have a particularly low-resolution monitor, maybe you're watching this from a uh, Dr. Game Boy of some kind, but San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward, uh, right now seeing creeping unemployment rates up to 4%, higher than the national average. In good times in the tech sector, we see San Francisco often falls significantly below uh, the U.S. average unemployment rate. Um, some sources of concern, you already know where they're going to be. We've seen a decline about 3% in the last year in professional and business services, um, a decline of 4% in the size of people employed in information in the information sector. But we've all Excuse me, we've also seen a growth of 7% in leisure and hospitality. So if you've looked at that uh, uh, opportunity to quit your job as a um, programmer and go and become that singing waiter uh, <laughs> at a local restaurant, maybe this is what we're seeing in the data. San Jose is almost the exact same story with slightly different numbers, except there's also a more pronounced loss in uh, manufacturing, uh, but there is also that similar pronounced loss in financial activities, about 5% over the last year, um, an increase in leisure and hospitality and government. Uh, but you also have this sort of disappointing information sector change down about a percent in the last year. Gosh, you got to catch up on these. Um, but that's where it is right now. So keep an eye on all this stuff. Okay, I took way too much time on that because I had so much to talk about in so little time. No, oh, that was fantastic. Um, I think that everybody gets so much benefit from this every month. And this was, we, we, we have, we, I think have six people watching on our Facebook group and we got 15 people here and they don't know that I just roped them into an MBA economics class and they got to all get it all for free. <laughs> I know, right? It is free, free for you, free for me. And I just like talking to you all. I don't, I'm not a compensated member of the Alberts List family, but I am grateful to do this because I get the questions like the ones you've entered. And I love the feedback, the engagement, and everything that you're able to provide. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's uh you get a lot of you get a lot of information coming out of here. It's drinking out of the fire hose for sure. And, you know, it's not as straightforward of an event to promote, like, say, um, how to how to how to be successful on LinkedIn or how to write a resume or a mock interview that we're doing tomorrow. But I think it's just so is so so important. Um and people are loving you in the comments here. I think it's really fantastic. And uh yeah. Uh Marsha, I, I know you love doing these questions and you know what? We'll do this again next month and we'll get even more questions. So uh I know Dr. White, you've been here for more than 90 minutes now. I think it's fantastic. Thank you guys um, so much. If you could, if you could sum up everything you just shared with well, shared with us in a few thoughts as we begin the year and look to the next, say even just month. Um what what are what is a major takeaway that you have that you would tell our job seekers here and anyone who's just watching uh, to to keep in mind as we look ahead? Great question, uh, um, uh, Albert. Next month and as we go ahead, in summary, think about this: uh, the market's going to remain is going to continue to be tricky in tech and financial services, but we have cautious signs of optimism on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, if we avoid an international financial crisis or unforeseen macroeconomic event. Um, there's a lot of good news. If the Fed lowers rates, that will encourage companies to consider reinvestment in a meaningful way. They'll look at some of their, um, uh, their plans for the future, their ability to grow. And I think you'll see some of the hiring pick up in sectors that um, potentially were not sources of hiring in the last year, in the next six months to 18 months. And that is my bottom line um, as we do it. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody. You guys are so nice today. You guys are like favorite <laughs> human beings. A pluses for everybody. I'm printing out everybody in NBA. 
Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. It's from a non prestigious I'll take a University of New Mexico. Uh, Albert's List State. State. It's very good. It's next to Chico, but nicer. But no, <laughs> less burning couches, but very fun. I love it. I love it. Well, you're getting a lot of uh, you're getting a lot of great kudos here, um, and so we're gonna let everyone go. Thank you all for coming in here to watch tonight. We appreciate your time. Uh, we'll have Dr. White back on here next week, and oh, not next week, next month. Excuse me. Uh, he can come back here next week if he wants. I just don't know if he has any more information to share with us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, watch out for more of our events coming up, including our January 2023 edition here in February. We'll talk to you all soon. And thank you all so much. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye.